Blog Talk Radio. We have, we have Douglas Loudmill from uh, Loudmill.com. And uh, Doug, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show, and I apologize for being late. Yeah, no problem. Good morning, Aaron. How are you? Oh, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Just, uh, well, I listened, I stayed up. Actually, I, I had in the background uh, the Peter Campbell interview from uh, June, and I okay. fell asleep to that. And, uh, <laughs> Fun. <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm doing my homework. Uh, and I really like to stay in that kind of a vein of thought because uh, while I, uh, I mean, because that's, that's, that's the that's the understanding that we need to have is about how the money system works. Yeah. Um, and it's something that we've covered on my past shows with like Bob Chapman and, you know, Pento. I just got a meal mail from Pento this morning. He's got his uh, interest rate time bomb is his, uh, what he feels about Operation Twist. So yeah. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? I mean, um, you know, we've covered it before, but you co- you're covering it from the deflation, uh, money contraction, dollar is what you want angle. All our other guests have always said, no, you don't want that. You want gold. So you're the opposite end of the spectrum, and that's why it's very important to get your input on this subject. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are at the. Uh, I am at the opposite end of the spectrum, and and uh, Peter as well. So if I say we, I'm, I'm referring to uh, Peter and I. Um, but you know, there's a there's a fundamental misunderstanding in our view of how money works and the money system, and um, it comes from the uh, understanding that money is debt. So money is created by issuing debt. And there's kind of this concept out there that money is created by printing it. And so this is very confusing. But in reality, only 5% of the money in existence is created by printing. And that's called fiat money. right? So the government says, we're going to declare that this, this you know, Federal Reserve note is money. And we're going to print it into existence. So great. You know, but that only accounts for about 5% of the money supply. The other 95% is created by lending it into existence. And... The, the organizations, given the, the, uh, the concession, let me call it, to create that money are called banks. So these banks, through the fractional reserve lending uh, infrastructure, are allowed to deposit you know, what they call high-power money with the Fed and then lend out 10 times that amount. Um, that amount is, is not in existence before they lend it, and this is the key understanding. They create it when they lend it. So they're given permission to create money. Um, there's a reason banks, when when the money supply is expanding and their lending are so profitable, it's because they're charging interest on money that they didn't have. Um, and so money is created. So if we look at 2001 through 2006, we had this massive increase in the money supply because basically the banks just, um, which is another story, but but with the uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall, the banks and the investment banks were able to basically become one entity. And so the banks who do the creating of the money were then packaging up, you know, those mortgages, which account for, you know, the vast majority of, of, of the amount of debt in the world is mortgages. Um, they didn't care that there was there, that, that they ultimately uh, weren't holding the risk because they were packaging them and selling them. So Glass-Steagall is, is what, you know, the repeal of Glass-Steagall created what, we've, what we're living through now. Um, so the, the banks lent money into existence. It massively increased the money supply. So your house today, I mean, I live in South Florida. I remember during that time I was looking at a house, and the, the realtor literally said to me, oh, just buy it, and in six months, if you don't like it, I'll get you another half a million dollars. That's what he said to me. And in, in my mind, I'm thinking, how long can this go on? It can't, Right. So the money supply was increased, 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 increased. Prices get inflated massively because money, there's more money out there. If you flood the market with money, then prices go up. So we had this massive increase to these ridiculous levels of, uh, in the housing, and ultimately we all know what happened. It collapsed, right, because it's just completely unsustainable. Well, what really happened, and again, this is what all the inflationists are missing, is that we destroyed a massive amount of money because when the loans either defaulted or were, were paid back, either one, and not lent out, the money that was created when they originally were loaned is gone into thin air, right where it came from. And so we destroyed more money 
than the Fed could ever print into existence. So quantitative easing is the Fed's last result, you know, last case emergency measure to simply try to get some liquidity back in the market, some. But they are not even close to getting as much money back in the market as was destroyed and is continuing to be destroyed. So inflation is far from our problem because we are still in a, in a situation where there's less money, and less money means there's less money chasing the, the same goods and services, which means the price of those goods and services are going to go down. And so the, the inflationists just have a fundamental misunderstanding. They think that money is created by printing it, and they don't realize that that's, that's the tiny little bit. And so when they see the Fed you know, uh, printing money, whether it's digital or physical, they assume that that means, oh, my God, we're going to inflate the dollar out of existence. Um, they don't understand that that's, that's not even coming close to the amount of money that we've already destroyed. Um, but, Aaron, man, this distinction is critical because, you know, the actions you take today are dependent on how you understand this. And if you think, you know, money's in, in, uh, we're going to inflate, well, you're going to do a whole different set of things than if you understand that money is, that we are actually in a deflationary period. Um, um, so our projection for gold is, is much lower. Our protection for silver is much lower. Our protection projection for real estate is much lower, um, and commodities, oil. Um, we're going to see gas at the pump go down, not up. Wages. And if you want some evidence for all this, just look around. I mean, real estate is in a deflationary mode. Anybody who says it's not is just not looking. Um, wages are in a deflationary mode. Anybody who says it, they are not is not looking. Um, so just because commodities have been inflationary, and, and um, that is not indicative of, the, of a, a hyperinflation. The reason commodities have been inflationary is purely because the quantitative easing was given directly to the banks, and the banks turned around, and what did they do with it? They, they traded it, um, and they put it into commodities um, as well as into the market. So what we have is this, this artificial um, filling up of this one particular sector. And, of course, that's what everybody sees. They see gas. They see milk. They see steak. They, you know, they see the things they live. So it, it's, it's supporting the misunderstanding that inflation is our problem. Well, um, I'll just uh, let you know that uh, I was one of the few people that said no QE3. It was all assumed that there would be a QE3. I even put this on my website. It's in a blog piece I did on my website, and I think I mentioned yep. it a couple of times on my pre previous radio shows. It was just I just saw people were assuming that there would be QE3, and, of course, when they did, and that broke the back of gold because I think you're right. They were relying upon that those continued uh, funny money uh you know, flowing in and pumping it up. And as far as demand goes, I did a video on the ghost cities of, of China. Uh, yeah. China. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, they've got these houses. Uh, what is it when a real estate agent uh, brings in somebody to like doll the place up with furniture and stuff like that? What, what they, they have, that was a profession that came out of that whole oh, boom. What was that? You know? Yeah. Right. Staging. They stage the house. Right. <laughs> So they have all these beautiful Which is a good metaphor for our economy. We have a staged economy. If you, <laughs> We really do. I mean, the, the last uh, three years of the QE has literally been to stage it, to try to fool us all into thinking that we didn't enter a depression in 2008, which is what really happened. I mean, we are in a depression. We've been in one since 2008, and, and we've been staging through quantitative easing this, this recovery. Um, it's falling apart right now, and, and you know everybody who's, who's finally getting around to going, wow, it looks like we might enter another recession, well, eventually they're going to wake up and realize we never left it. You know, we, we, we've been in a depression. Plus, I did a piece uh, that was about uh, what's, which Rothschild was it? Uh, Jacob. Jacob Rothschild, the old man from England. Uh, there's two old men, uh, Rothschilds, that are relevant. There's David in France and Jacob in England. And yeah. uh, he came out it was on Bloomberg, and he mentioned that the glaring uh, thing that was coming, glaring was his words, and he was basically saying, no, there's no more gravy train. It's not going to happen. And that was, I think, in, I don't know, March or something like that, or April, something like that. He came out and said that, kind of like went under the radar, because people don't recognize his significance. I do, obviously. Anybody who 
reads history would, but it put it together. And so I, so I made my thesis out, and it's coming to pass as well. Uh, it's a little bit belated, but I think I was looking at the chart. I think the back of gold has been broken. Uh, and with the seasonals going, just think when the seasonals wear out in uh, uh, you know December or January, gold's going to probably really take a tumble. I mean, it has uh, all in costs at about eleven hundred, so I could see the base of gold c- coming back to eleven hundred. Uh, the only thing that's keeping it up right now is that all the uh, ETFs and stuff have it liquidated out and flooded the market with supply. Uh, but that has happened in platinum, palladium, and some. To some extent, silver. What I which what I follow, so it's it's out there, ready to fall like a viejo. Uh, once the seasonals are over, I think. Yeah, our, we're our target for gold is six hundred bucks. For silver, is under four. I mean, the silver <laughs> and parabolic under four. Uh, parabolic trades end up back to where they started the the parabola. Um, and so, you know, the, the, again, fundamental misunderstanding. People have this inflationary idea that somehow we're printing ourselves out. That means that we're going to somehow go back to hard money, which is gold and silver, and therefore we've got this concept that gold and silver are the anti-inflationary trade. It's just wrong on all counts. It, 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 first of all, gold and silver aren't money. You, you can't go to the store and buy anything with it. Um, I mean, I had some a client tell me uh, that they took a, a golden eagle in and they offered it to somebody for like a $20 uh, um, uh, purchase, and they just said no. They're like, I'm sorry, I can't take it. Oh, yeah. We're not going to be guys. going back to gold and silver. We have to still convert. I'm not saying they're not an asset, they, they, but they still have to be converted into fiat money. But again, back to this concept. So what we're having is a deleveraging of our fiat credit money. And if, right. if we can just get the distinction between fiat money, which is the 5% that has been printed into existence or, uh, or digitally printed into existence that doesn't, isn't backed by debt or isn't created by debt, and the fiat credit money, which is created by debt, what's happening is we're deleveraging in the fiat credit money. And where are we going to go to? Fiat money. Which is why, in my book, the dollar is is going to be through the ceiling, um, because what what currency in the world right now, what fiat currency in the world can handle the influx of of, of the flight to safety that is going to occur? Um, there's only one. We are the tallest midget, and that's the dollar. So, you know, I expect the dollar to be, you know, the dollar index now is uh, what 78. I expect it to be at 178. Um, and if you want to talk wow. about the trade of the century, that's it. Well, those are some pretty bold, and I would say, uh, no offense, kind of extreme uh, projections. But I like your rationale about returning back to the mean. Uh, and, uh, well, let's be fair uh, and, and uh, include – see, I, I didn't hear what you – when I listened to you and Mr. Campbell, I didn't hear you mention any names – or any other uh, stuff that we kind of get into in the truth movement, and it's important if you're going to discuss this topic. Yeah, I think you got to if you don't want to include it in every other breath, you got to at least uh, you know understand or like admit that you know <laughs> the other end of the story of that, which is that you know this is a cartel. Uh, this is the dollar is part of a wider uh, global banking cartel, okay, and it's been owned, or created pretty much in this uh, latest since the 1600s by the Rothschilds and their associates, okay, uh, and those are the original shareholders of the Federal Reserve System, mm-hmm. and the Federal Reserve System, people can still join the Federal Reserve System like state banks, but they have to pay a fee to get their shares, which are mm-hmm. non-transferable. And by law, they are guaranteed a 6% return on that uh, money that they pony up to get in. Okay, and they can, uh, So that's, a lot of people don't know those details, but that's how that works. And so when yeah. you're talking about what you're talking about, that's other concrete facts right there. Now, the, here's the thing, though. The problem with gold and silver, though, it is the antithesis of the dollar – Federal Reserve note. And so they are trapped in a dichotomy when you invest in this stuff. You have to recognize uh, that's just like, uh, I don't know what the analogy would be. I don't want to like dream up some weird analogy, but uh, basically 
they are keeping the price of gold and silver down or under control by selling fiat currency short uh, in the you know the CME and the, and combine that with the margin requirements and stuff like that. That's your headwind, is my point. If you're going to have this idea that what you're you know you're what you what you're not, but the other side is like say the Bob Chapman camp or the Gerald mm-hmm. Salenti camp, okay? Yeah. You have got that headwind, and that's an ugly one. Because they want, see, that's the way I look at it, and I've always said this on different shows I've gone on and stuff like this, is this. Uh, the Federal Reserve, the dollar, is a separate from the United States and its debt. This is the this is important distinction. I really didn't hear you guys. Uh, I want to get your insights, what you think about my thesis, okay? Mm-hmm. There are two separate things. I, I tried to go over this with Pento as well, and he's not uh, totally in agreement with me on this. I think it's just, and this is the reason why this can exist, your paradigm that you're calling mm-hmm. for. Because the debt is separate from the Federal Reserve note dollar, okay? The Fed is a private uh, group of privately held banks. There is no government banks. They're all private banks. Bank of America is a private bank. Uh, it's a publicly traded private company. Yeah. City, Morgan, and everything like that. That's what the Federal Reserve is comprised of. There is no Bank of the United States uh, that Obama is the uh, you know leader of or something like that. Okay, that's very important. So he argued with me. He said that, no, it's not pri- private. I said, yes, it is private. It's comprised of private entities. It has this quasi-government thing, but that's because there's a law and a charter involved, just like the two previous uh, uh, attempts before. This is our third national bank uh, by the Rothschilds. Yeah, so, correct. Let me, just, let me just finish to say that the two things are separate. And the reason why we didn't have QE3, and this is what I put in my blog post to tell everybody, especially likes of Bill, uh, Bob Chapman and uh, Alex Jones, was that they didn't want to deteriorate their business model, and that's what it was looking like. And so by doing another QE3 here on the dollar, it was going to demean, uh, demean uh, the credibility of their business which is creating fiat currency for other governments. This is Rothschild at the core. He goes into the king and says, let me handle your money. You, you, you worry about the wars and go run off and uh, fight with each other. I'll take care of your money. Okay? I've shown I can do that good. That's essentially it. And so the debt that's being built up $15 trillion and going has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve, no dollar. People don't understand. It's denominated, sure. And they tried to help us out by uh, uh, inflating it down. Now that game's not working because everybody else is pissed off. They also went to the uh, you know def- uh, race to the bottom, and of course China was squawking about it. So that's the two things. Uh, so that's why I really I'm kind of more because after listening to Bob Chapman and the other guests we have that are all gold bugs, listen to a paper bug if you will, and I know it's yeah. not all you know it's not all created in paper. Uh, that, wow, you know what? Jeez, uh, I think I see it a little bit clearer now. And this is the most complicated subject. If it wasn't, everybody would be out doing central banking fiat currencies. The fact is, it's a very difficult subject. And most people, the eyes roll over the top of the head on this one, man. I mean, they just go, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, you're you're correct. And, um, you know, Bill still makes a good point in Secrets of Oz that, you know, he goes over the the, the attempts before to create the central bank. And fiat money is not the problem. Fiat credit money is the problem. And um, if you really want a system that works, you've got to understand what money represents. Money represents a promise. Uh, It represents trust. That's it. So if you and I, Aaron, want to trade, we don't need money. If I trust you and I say, hey, I'll give you this, and I'll trust you later to give me back what is the equivalent that we agree to. We don't need any money. And, and theoretically, the entire globe could transact on trust. Well, of course, that's a little bit uh, you know, optimistic to think we can all transact on trust. So instead, we have this thing that represents our promise to pay, and that is this, 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 this bill, you know, this fiat money. Um, it was gold, it was shells, it was everything else, of course, but you know, it, it ended up being money. Well, if we all actually had a fiat money that we agreed on, and, and this is the key point, there was a limit 
in its quantity, and that, that the quantity was, let's say, pegged to um, population and not to anything else, then the, we would have a fixed quantity of money that was in circulation, and everything could transact. There would be no inflation because inflation is a, a byproduct of an increase in the money supply. And we can have a globe that actually functions and a government that would be responsible um, and limited. The problem with this, as many people have pointed out, like Bob Prechter, who's also a deflationist, um, Elliott Wave International is his, you know, his his uh, um, way of thinking and his company and his movement. Um, as pointed out, is that you know, you, when can you ever trust a government to do anything? So you know, yes, that works. But you know, how can you trust a government not to actually increase its its quantity? Um, and you know, we can say, well, we can make it constitutional. Well, we see what where the constitution has gotten us. It's it's virtually gone. So you know, yes is the answer to this. Um, and the distinction is right now what I'm concerned with is one yes I want to understand the fundamental principles of how we would would set up a an ideal monetary system which in my mind would be a fiat currency I don't want my currency backed by something that is perceived as valuable in its own right it corrupts the currency it also makes it subject to uh, things that are completely out of my control so if we say okay now the global currency is going to be backed by gold well, if you know we find a, a, a mountain of gold in Nigeria, well, now Nigeria now controls the money supply. That's that's not functional, um, and so and of course gold also is can be controlled and cornered, and it doesn't make sense. What makes sense is a fiat currency, a pure fiat currency, something that has no value that truly represents what money is supposed to be, which is a promise, a trust, a trust relationship, which ultimately represents the human behind the trust. And that's what I care about is the human behind the trust. Money should serve the humans, not the other way around. We've got it the other way around. We serve the money. And, and, and we've got such corruption built into our mentality, our corporate mentality, and the money system itself that it cannot stand because it doesn't it no longer represents the humans it actually is is in its own right become this goal and you yes you're right on the Rothschilds and the way the system was set up was designed with that thinking and so that's the problem and since we have and the way they set it up was to basically create themselves in the middle with a vig and a concession that they could pass out to their member banks well, that's that's why we have created credit money, credit fiat money. So again, if we could make the distinction between fiat money and credit fiat money, or paper money, as you say, in your paper bug, which I would agree with, uh, um, then and and paper fiat credit money, which is not not the same thing. What we're going through now is a deleveraging of the fiat credit money, and where is it going to deleverage to? Fiat money. And here's the thing, people. Just take a look at what any deleveraging looks like. Take a look at what a personal deleveraging looks like. You know, in, in, if a family gets too leveraged and they've borrowed for their home, they've borrowed for their four cars, they've borrowed for their boat, they've borrowed for everything, and they get to the point where they can't sustain the borrowing, they declare bankruptcy. That means that everything goes down. Their property is all sold for, for fire sale value. Everything just gets personally you know, uh, uh, sold and they go back and their entire standard of living gets contracted back to a minimum of what they're allowed to keep and what their current income su can sustain. That's what personal deleveraging looks like. Well, let's look at corporate deleveraging. It looks exactly the same. The corporation is over leveraged, the assets get sold, the employees get fired, and, and the bondholders take haircuts. Everything gets sucked back down to this base level. And, and the assets are sold out, and there's, there's, there's nothing left except the, the salvage value of everything. Well, now let's look at what a, a government looks like when it deleverages. The same exact thing except just worse. Now we have the, the bondholders all, get, they all take haircuts or get nothing. The currency is destroyed. People lose all their money in the banks. Just look at Argentina in 1999. They literally lose their money. It's gone. And the entire standard of living for the entire country gets sucked back to this subsistence, bare minimum level of living. Well, now look, imagine that all of those things are happening in the vast majority of all of the countries in the globe all at the same time. That's what we're facing right now a global deleveraging. And there is nobody who can predict how bad that can look. But what I can say is that you know, my job as an asset protection attorney has always been 
to prepare for an unlikely but potentially devastating event. That's the definition of, of why anybody would do asset protection. You know, asset protection is, is the concept of you know, setting up legal structures and, and, and tools to protect your assets in the event that you get sued. That's the asset protection. So that's the world I came from. And that's, I'm a lawyer. I'm an asset protection attorney. So when I took this concept and applied it to money, I took the exact same concept. What to do, how can I prepare for an unlikely but potentially devastating event? Well, I, I won. I, I used to consider it unlikely. I, it's getting more and more likely in my book every day, but let's just continue to call it unlikely. An unlikely, uh, and let's call that event a global deleveraging, a global bankruptcy of the credit money system. Right? What would you do to prepare for that unlikely but catastrophic event? Well, what I would do is I would get into cash. I would get into fiat currency, ironically. And I would get it into a non-leveraged institution that's not going to be part of the explosion. Um, I wouldn't be putting it into inflationary assets like gold, silver, real estate, stock market, none of that. Um, and, and so from that position of cash, and yes, you could diversify your cash, but you want to do it in fiat currency that has the capacity of the government behind it to print print their money. And there's really only a few in the globe that I would consider, um, the United States being number one, um, Singapore, New Zealand, and Switzerland. I mean, that's basically the four governments that can print their own money and that uh, fundamentally uh, would be able to and would likely print their way out of it. Um, so again, printing your way out of it is not the problem. I'm not worried about inflation. I'm worried about deflation and global deleveraging and if if you want to talk about how fast you can destroy something deleverage it it destroys it instantly um and and which is why you know people who were worried that the qe one and two were going to somehow inflate us i mean it's not even a drop in the bucket there's there's no chance that we're going to hit inflation and and again i just point to look up and look around you everything is deflating and by the way the commodities are starting to follow suit and so is the market um, I get comments from people right now saying, well, what should I do? I'm in the market. I'm down. I'm feeling bad. You know, uh, uh, But we're at the lows. And my comment back is, the lows? Are you kidding? We're at the highs. We're at the highs if you, if you want to look at what's about to happen. Um, and people like Bob Prechter expect the Dow at 2,000 or 1,000. And I don't disagree. I think that's um, as likely a scenario as the, as the Dow at 12,000 or 14,000. Actually, I consider it much more likely. But even if you wanted to call it 50-50, you know, what's the impact of the Dow at 14,000? Well, you know, if you sit it, sit it out, then you, you missed a little bit of gain. What's the impact of the Dow at 1,000? Catastrophic. So, again, well, you know, my whole mandate is to protect against an unlikely but catastrophic event. Right. And so uh, um, it's a conservative viewpoint, ultra-conservative uh Asset preservation. You have the money. No need to uh, run around like a drunken sailor with your investment uh, mentality and get yourself into a situation where you're no longer uh, so wealthy that you actually have to well, go back to work or something. <laughs> that's right. And, and and so now once you get there, once I once once somebody comes to that realization, yes. Now they say, well, wait, is there any way that I can actually take advantage of this? Well, then yes. Then my answer is yes. Now that you've gone to safety, now let's consider putting your you know, toe back into the pool, but let's do it in a way that you, you're doing it, taking advantage of. So, you know, let's say, let's take 20% of your assets and go back in, but let's go back in, in a managed way that's going to actually take advantage of, of the fall, because, you know, there is a ton of opportunity, Aaron. I mean, right now, uh, uh, markets fall much faster than they rise, which means money can also be made much faster on the way down than it can on the way up. There's nothing wrong with with hedging your purchasing power by taking a portion of your money and putting it in the game, um, and and so you know in my practice that's what I've done. I've created a fund for my clients that I can specifically do exactly that, and it is part of exactly what you said. Extremely conservative viewpoint. I mean, I'm coming from safety first, and then you know how can I hedge and protect the purchasing power of my clients so that when this thing shakes out in you know five years. Um, they're sitting with cash, and, and there will be a time to go back in and buy assets. And I know my, my time frame on that is probably about five years. Um, once this all shakes out, 
And and yeah, then you're going to want to have a lot of cash, and you want to go in and buy all those pieces of real estate and all those things that you wanted. Um, but now is the time to be patient and to protect your cash, protect and increase it if if you can. Well, um, one thing that I've noticed here is that uh, people changing their game plan or changing their targets as uh, events on the timeline unfold. <clears throat> and this is why on my show I like to uh, criticize these people. Like, for example, Gerald Salente, extremely nice guy. Mm-hmm. I just had a problem, and he's the first one to complain about brown nosers and suck-ups. Uh, and I just happened to complain with him, which was, listen, you said gold 2000 and 2010. That did not happen. Okay, let's give you a little slack. Let's say you're off a little bit. How about gold 2000, 2011? At this point, doesn't look like it's going to happen. It could, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> don't think yeah. so. So yeah. at this point, so that's another two years on this thing. The point is to uh, visit these uh, uh, predictions and <clears throat> admit when you're wrong is what I'd like to see someone do. From the, but in, in, instead to get into this mealy mouth, explain it. I also went into this with the, the CPM groups, uh, David uh, or Jeff Christian. Only on email. I, I've emailed back and forth been quite a bit on this. But we have him on Bloomberg earlier this year saying, I think gold 1200 or something like this 1300. And then when it shot up and everything, I started ha- uh, hammering him. And he changed his uh, whole thing up to include the newest price ranges. And I was going, that's so disingenuous. Why is there any column on it? But. Uh, he has projections for metals that are, are well, not like extremely low as uh, that you and Mr. Campbell's, but ratcheting back, uh, more fundamentally based and priced that way. So uh, well, that's kind of like a mid midway uh, midway point, I guess. the The case for gold and silver uh, is being made that. The dollar is going to collapse, but since it's a separate entity from the debt, it doesn't. It's, there's the only pressures on it to collapse were the uh, the QE3 uh, prospects of that, because they would be putting that on their balance sheet. They would like. Uh, let's go back to what you were saying before. Okay, in that that in that cartoon that, that uh, what's that what's that one guy does that cartoon that explains the Federal Reserve and the money system that you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Did I mention? I didn't mention a cartoon, did I? I think. Well, no. I th- but he has a cartoon version of it too. That's the one I saw before. Uh, oh, what's okay. that guy who? He talks about the Rothschilds and money creation and stuff like that. Uh, oh, Bill but, Still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Using the Bill Still, the simple uh, how the Fed works. Uh, the king wants money, so he doesn't have any. So he goes to Rothschild and says, "I need money." Rothschild says, "No problem." Uh, I will give you my money, which is Federal Reserve notes in this uh, analogy. It's I printed it, I control it, I make it. It's mine. It's my business. I'll give it to you. It's recognized everywhere, though. That's the good part about it. You can mm-hmm. take my money and do it, spend it anywhere, and then trade with it anywhere. Like you were saying, that mm-hmm. trust issue. Yeah, the ultimate concession from government is to be the guy who gets to print and be the money supplier. I mean, it, it is the ultimate <laughs> insider's concession. I mean, it's 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 brilliant. Okay, and I, and I want I want to I, I want to take a, di- a divergence of what I was saying for one second because I was studying the city state of Sparta. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing my research on it. And you know what? Very interesting. It just goes to show you these things are cycles, and we've crossed these bridges mentally uh, before. Mm-hmm. In Sparta, what they used to use as money were iron bars. And they did that for a reason. Not because they didn't have gold and silver. They could go out and kick anybody's ass and get there somebody else's gold and silver if they wanted it. Because they were the number one fighters of their age, and they were. But they also a lot of the things about people know about uh, Sparta. It was the most developed uh, constitutional type of uh, city-state republic, or whatever you want to call it, in a certain respect. Uh, a lot of people only know about the violence, uh, about the military aspect of them. But they had the iron bars because that money 
it was designed to screw up the trading system and not to be held hostage to gold hoarders and stuff like that and gold manipulators. Like like in your other example, like, hey, if you control all the gold, then you, all of a sudden you screw everybody's uh, gold-backed money uh, systems. Because that, now, obviously, that will happen. So they used iron bars that they had stamped out from their mint or everything like that, and that screwed everything up. Again, iron bar, what is it? Like, back to your analogy. Doesn't have to be gold. Something very valuable that you know. It's, well, uh, in England, yeah. used uh, what they call tally sticks, which was a piece of wood off a tree that they split in half. They gave one half to the guy and one half to the guy who who uh, uh, was issuing the money, and and that was it. You can only match the two halves, and they put little notches on them, and that was it. It worked brilliantly until you know the money creators came in and 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 got it out. Um, Money should not be anything but the pure representation of the trust, which is why fiat money is the answer. We really, fiat money is, is the right way to see money. Fiat credit money is the problem, and the fiat credit money deleveraging is what's creating all this, this massive uncertainty. And, um, you know, how and where we got there in one perspective is almost irrelevant. I'm most concerned, and, and I'm not saying it is irrelevant. It's very interesting, and, and it's relevant, particularly when we rebuild the system. But today, if you're sitting here, I mean, m the number one question I'm asked is, great, all fascinating, Doug. What do I do? What do I do now? I, 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 I want to make sure that I can have a home for my family and feed my kids in the next five years. And so from my perspective, um, I'm curious and intellectually you know, fascinated by – this conversation and, and you know how we got there, but I'm more, I'm more curious and I'm I'm more driven to action by you know what is the impact of this understanding, and which is why you know the understanding that there are two pieces to the money supply, the the, the credit version and the pure fiat version is so critical because everybody is just lumping them all together. And, and I think this is the point that you're making. You know, we've got we've got the the fiat money, which is one thing, which is totally separate from the debt and everything else that's around it. And it's that debt and everything else which is collapsing or deleveraging. Okay. Uh, obviously, there all these things are uh, rubbing it up against each other. Uh, there's the selling down of gold, more extent of silver to keep it uh, not an alternative. Uh, to fiat uh, Federal Reserve system. Uh, well, it's not an alternative. Uh, it's just not an alternative. I mean, it's it's, it's an it's anachronism, not. I think, because people looking back, I think that's the it's nostalgic too. It's like it's uh, nostalgic. Have... They're they're yes. It's it's more of in their mind. It's some kind of. I mean, look when gold was. I mean, when silver was fifty bucks. When it hit fifty, we saw lines of people, literally lines of people lining up at, at the at the silver, you know, gold store. And in my mind I'm going, Oh my God, they're finally all willing to sell and in literally when you stop and ask, they were lined up to buy. I mean, this is the mentality that we have. It wait till it's at it's absolute extreme and get in the wrong side of that trade. And 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 that's exactly what happened to gold at nineteen hundred and, and I mean it, we may never see gold higher than its peak and if we do it's it's going to be a temporary bounce um and again i'm talking within the next five ten years you know as we deleverage i don't know you know in the biggest longest term picture it doesn't mean gold won't still be able to buy what it bought i mean if gold you know if you can buy x number of barrels of oil with gold today i'm going to say that you're going to still be able to buy x number of barrels of gold oil with gold tomorrow because oil is going to be 25 bucks a barrel but gold's going to be 600. So, you know, it's it's again, it's deflationary. It hits everybody. It hits all of us. Which is why any strategy that relies on you being correct in your analysis is scary to me. I don't I don't need to be correct in my analysis. I need to be hedged. I need to be protected and safe. So, if I'm wrong, here's the way I see it as an asset protection attorney, as someone concerned about safety, if I'm wrong and I've I've moved to cash, and I've taken 20% of my assets, and I've 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 um, actively engaged in risk. Then I'm going to be okay. But if I if I buy a certain direct, either way, if the economy recovers, oh, yeah. I'm fine. If the economy collapses, I'm fine. I'm 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 doing something that doesn't rely me on me being right about my analysis. If I pick a direction, 
you know, if I actually say, oh, this is my direction, I think this, and I'm going to act accordingly, I have to be right for it to work. And and that's that's a scary position, to have to be right for your fallback plan to work. I want my fallback yeah. plan to work regardless of what happens. I mean, it's kind of like Ken Wilber, the philosopher, um, who when everybody, when, when you know, quantum physics came out and, and people started tying it to theories and concepts of God, he said, well, be very careful when you hitch your concept of God to a new theory or, you know, a new understanding, what happens when it changes? You know, don't hitch your concept of, of anything to um, a direction because you're ultimately, the understanding will change. Well, that's so the same conservative uh, well, background uh, coming out again there. Yeah, right. It's, and I, and I, have to, I have to agree, it's very sensible to look at it in those terms. So, you're saying, uh, well, go eighty. You're saying, are you saying like eighty uh, percent cash and then twenty percent super speculative uh, money? That even if you lose it, and you're but you're employing your theses, even if you lose it, you still have eighty percent of your cash, and uh, you know which is going to be good too. Is that what you're saying or what? Well, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't even say super speculative. I would say I would say appropriately managed. So in my case, 80% in cash. Uh, right now, the dollar, because I see the dollar is, is is the right side of the trade. But I would I will I will absolutely diversify that into the appropriate currencies as the situation develops. And 20%, I I like the futures market, um, managed in futures, taking advantage, mostly short the market. You know, so if I can be up, you know, 40%. 80%, 100%, you know, whatever it is my risk tolerance is, on that 20%, um, let's just say I'm up 40% a year on 20% of my money. It's like making 8% a year on all of my money. You know, that's that's cool for me. If I want more, I can take more risk. Uh, futures, I think, is the, the best way to do it because it's it's extremely liquid. You're, you're highly capable of being able to go both directions, unlike the equities market where it's very hard to go short. I mean, Europe, they're banning short selling. It's just insane. Um, and so futures is the most professional, the most liquid market in the world, and it's very easy to, to be on the short side of the trade. Um, and so that's why I use it. But, you know, again, 20% of my money. So, yes, I'm, that is what I'm saying. A conservative strategy where you're taking most of your money off the table, you're not betting on a certain philosophy or thesis about the way the world's got to go, and then – appropriately taking advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you with the best product in the market to do so, which in my book is futures. Okay, so that kind of uh, eludes to um, uh, you have uh, another business that you uh, operate as well outside of the uh, asset protection uh, firm. Is, is that correct? Uh, is that what's going on with you? Yeah, I run a hedge fund that does exactly that for, for the 20%. So again, my I was coming from you know the asset protection mindset. How do I help my clients? And so my answer was <laughs> this strategy, which is 80% in cash, 20% properly managed. So I created the fund to properly manage the futures, um, and that's you know that's the other half of my world. And that 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 was an evolution out of my asset protection experience, not because I grew up wanting to be a money manager. I, I actually grew up not wanting to be. I you know I was a lawyer. My mandate was legal. But in 2008, I literally watched as I could not protect my client's money. I mean, it just evaporated in front of their eyes and in front of my eyes. As their real estate portfolios just just took a nosedive, and as their stock portfolios took a nosedive. And so I literally said, I, what could I possibly do? I mean, I've, I've spent my, my career focusing on protecting their assets, telling them that, you you know, you can, reducing the fear level of my clients so that they can go out and live a full and fully expressed life, and that's what I believe we're here to do, is to live a fully expressed life, and it's very hard to do that when you're afraid, so any infrastructure or any tools that I can create and help implement to lower fear, to me, supports the goal of why we're really here in, on this earth as humans, right, which is to live fully expressed. Um, so when 2008 came, I realized there was a huge hole in my, in, in my strategy because I had handled only the legal. But the real risk going forward was glaringly apparent to me was no longer legal. It was market. It was purchasing power. And that's when I started searching for, okay, what w is the strategy that would appropriately do that? And, and what we just talked about is, is what I came to. 
and what I'm implementing now for my clients. Okay. Um, well, uh, I heard like when you were talking uh, on one of I think it was uh, uh, Mr. Cohen or uh, Shapiro or something. What was his name? Uh, the guy who first uh, was starting in this uh, uh, offshore asset protection trust uh, business. What's his Howard name? Howard Rosen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Howard uh-huh. Rosen. Yeah. And you guys were talking about uh, Swiss banks yeah. as being a way to we'll do with something with the eighty other eighty percent, right? Uh, to invest it in a sane uh, banking system, not like right. uh, at risk, like you know. Uh, defaulting banks uh, and this type of thing. So that's the other. Let's talk, let's talk about the eighty percent where you're planning on putting that, for example, in your hedge fund. Um, but now they've closed down the opportunity. Basically, I, I was doing a little research on that, and they're like uh, people that are you know offer to open up Swiss bank accounts like on the internet or something. Uh, yeah. They're like uh, no U.S. customer, sorry, uh, <laughs> this type of thing. So uh, right, and then you, yeah. So there's like a come down. Have, what have you? How does that develop for you? As far as like, because it seems like you and him are very much uh, keen to get going with some uh, Swiss banks for your uh, money. And now that that one's taken off uh, your menu potentially, I'm just guessing. Uh, what do you do with that eighty percent that you want to keep uh, in cash or fiat? Well, it's not taken off the menu at all. I mean, it's taken off of the the uh, the Burger King menu, but it's not taken off our menu. Um, the internet world of opening up a Swiss bank online and in the you know the James Bond concept that I'm going to have my own private numbered account it it's never been really on the menu and whatever was there was 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 highly flawed. Real Swiss banking is still alive and well, um, and uh, I open up accounts for my clients all the time who are U.S. clients. So it's it's not off the table. It's off the table for someone who's not introduced to the bank by a reputable source. The banks don't want any problems. They don't, and they don't want you know accounts off the internet. That's true. But um, clients that are coming through me are, are, do not have problems opening up Swiss accounts. And, and yes, I still use Switzerland. And you know it's probably worth talking about the distinctions between the Swiss banking system and the the rest of the banking system. And when I say the Swiss banking system, there really is two banking systems in Switzerland. There's the commercial banking system, and then there's the um, there's the private Swiss private banking system. Um, as as reputation has it, you know the Swiss are the best bankers in the world, and and they withstood you know the test of time with with global trauma. Um, there's a reason, and it, it's because the Swiss in the Swiss private banking side don't lend out your money. They don't take risk. They're, they're, it's called a trust banking system. And so when you give your money to Bank of America, Bank of America that money becomes an asset of Bank of America. It literally is an asset on their balance sheet, and they enter a corresponding liability to the account holder. So you are now taking the risk that Bank of America is going to be able to pay you, whereas in the Swiss banking system, it is not an asset of the bank. When you open an account, it is your asset. It is segregated. If the bank goes bankrupt, it does not affect your account, and they are only holding it. And The difference is Bank of America can now use your money to deposit with the Fed as high-powered money and loan out ten times as much. So if you deposit $1,000 with the Bank of America, not only have you you just given your money to the bank and hoped that they're going to be able to pay you back, even though you think it's sitting in your account, it's not, but they've lent out $10,000 on top of that, thus adding to the credit fiat money problem that we've already discussed. Where in the Swiss banking system, you have to pay them to hold your money because if they can't lend it out, there's, they're not going to lend it. So you have to actually pay them interest to hold your money, kind of like what we're doing with you know, short-term treasuries right now. There's a negative yield, right? You've got to pay the U.S. government if you want them to hold your money, which, by the way, also is completely supportive of, of, of what we've just been talking about as far as you know, the dollar strengthening. You know, why would, why, to digress, why would S&B downgrade the credit of the United States and then all of a sudden we see the, the yields – on treasuries going negative because it doesn't make any sense, right? You should downgrade. We should have, the treasury should have to pay more interest, and they have to pay less. And it's because the downgrade was indicative of the global problems, and the negative yield was indicative of the fact that everybody still, we're still the tallest midget, so everybody's going to run to treasuries. Um, so to go back to this with banking now, 
the tr the Swiss bank is a trust bank, and so um, yes, it's still safe to have my money there. Um, they're not lending it out. They don't have a subprime por portfolio. They don't have a trading desk. They're not they're not taking risk with my money and gambling it, and and they don't have it as an asset on their books. It's segregated. It's my asset. Um, so, yes, that's why I still like the Swiss banking system, and that's where the 80% ideally would go. Um, there is another option, especially if we're talking about amounts of money that are less than minimums for Swiss banks, which are typically half a million dollar minimums, and wow. that's uh, Treasury Direct. Um, so, you know, let's say you have $50,000 and you want to be in the safest place on earth. I would personally um, consider opening an account with Treasury Direct. Um, again, counterintuitive. People are like, oh, the Treasury is the problem. But but they that means there's no intermediary and i'm very concerned about counterparty risk i mean if you look at 2008 and you look at lehman brothers that was the problem it was counterparty risk that's why every bank quit lending to each other because the counterparty risk element became this unknown and nobody knew if the counterparties were good so interbank lending froze which is you know how you ended up with with <laughs> all of wall street sitting in bush's office going this we will collapse tomorrow if we don't do something um, so I don't want any counterparty risk. So Treasury, uh, direct Treasury, short-term 30-day Treasuries with the Treasury leaves me no counterparty risk. And so, you know, for amounts as small as ten thousand dollars, you can do that. How much is that paying though? Sorry. Negative. <laughs> You're going to pay them. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Just like a Swiss bank, which tells you something. You're now oh. going to pay Treasury to hold your money for 30 days. But it's exactly what's happened. That's exactly how the Swiss bank works. You pay them 1% of the amount you put on deposit to hold it. Really? The, the new mandate, Aaron, is going to be a return of your money, not a return on your money. Because if you can't get if, – if people one day wake up and they realize, like they did in Argentina, that they can't get into their bank, that it's not there, the money's not there, then a return of your money will seem fantastic. You know, and people are still in the mentality of I need a return on my money. It's it's just in a deflationary world, having the money that you have today, having it tomorrow is a return on your money, because everything is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So if you have ten thousand dollars today, and you end up having that same ten thousand dollars in in a year, and everything has gone down by twenty percent, it's as if you got a twenty percent return on your money, right? Yeah, exactly. See, that's a again. Getting your brain around these subjects, it's very nebulous, and that's really well said. Exactly. I mean, yeah, so you pay 1%, but everything's cheaper, and if you want to go in and buy up some assets that, you know, make sense, then you can do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, well, listen, I mean, I tried to get online Thursday till Monday or Tuesday. Bank of America was down. Yeah. Was down the whole what is that I mean, an example of it? Yeah, I, mean, I went yeah, into I, I went into a, a bank that I have an account and I asked for uh, nine thousand dollars in cash and they said no. I mean, I, I was shocked. They were like, "We don't have it." I'm like, Are "You're kidding me!" They've already reduced ATM withdrawal limits in Europe. I mean, cash, hundred dollar bill cash is going to start getting more and more difficult to find. I mean, and, and again, the, the the scary thing about this is that when it happens, it can happen so fast that that you won't have time. People who say, well, I'm just going to wait. This is all very, you know, wow, but very extreme. Let me just wait and see what happens. The problem with waiting, just like asset protection, is that once it happens, the, your planning opportunities become very limited or non-existent. So it <laughs> just doesn't pay to wait. You know, plan now. And if you're wrong, so what? You're wrong. You've got your money in cash. What's the big deal? But if you're right, you've saved. You've literally saved yourself from a catastrophic event. So, you know, if you're someone listening to this and you have like $20,000 in the bank and that's your life savings and you have a home, that maybe you have equity and maybe you don't, I empathize exactly where you're at. You need that $20,000. And if you can't get to it, then that's a problem. So, Make sure you can get to it. And if that means taking it out and putting $100 bills somewhere safe in your possession, we'll do it. Um, and if it means, you know, maybe you have 100000 If it means putting in 80000 of it with Treasury Direct, great. I mean, that you've reduced some risk. The, the impact of being wrong is virtually nothing. The, the, the impact of, of getting this wrong and not planning is catastrophic. 
which is why I say my philosophy is not an investment philosophy. I'm not trying to compete with, you know, uh, philosophies of diversified portfolios and all. I mean, I talk to investment advisors from time to time, and they all come back with, well, you know, I'm, I've been in this game for a long time, and here's what makes sense. And I'm like, look, I'm not coming from the investment world. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm an asset protection attorney. I'm seeing this from an asset protection perspective. I have identified a risk that is significant, and the impact of that risk is potentially catastrophic. That right there fits for me the definition of something that requires immediate action to, to protect from that risk. And I'm not trying to compete with your investment philosophy. And you know what? This will be over in a few years, and the actions you take today will determine where you sit when this thing that finally the dust settles. So, um, you know, it's just a different perspective, and, and, uh, and I feel like that's, you know, that's what makes this valuable right now because it's not it's not investment advice it's protection advice okay um with respect to uh you know a little bit more of uh the asset protection uh thing because uh well uh if you have a business and it's spinning off free cash you know and you want to know what to do with it uh you got your your, your plan there but uh, all of those things that you're investing in have to uh, be uh, put into some sort of a safe place, right, away from creditors. Uh, that's what you're kind of talking about there uh, in, your, in your main field. So uh, kind of uh, reverse engineering, when someone comes to you, uh, like a doctor or something, and they, you know, they have a business that's throwing off cash on a regular basis, has been, uh, and it's pooling up someplace. Uh, uh, we know what you want to do with it now, uh, eighty twenty. But how are you protecting all your good, uh, you know, decision making as far as that goes, so that it doesn't, uh, you know, you know, somebody say that hey, you squeezed my boobs while I was uh, under uh, anesthesia, fork it over. <laughs> Oh well, that's the that's that's back to the legal side. And yes, we use legal tools so that when you have that account open in Switzerland, it's actually open in the name of your asset protection trust, which has you know the appropriate jurisdiction where if you get sued, you know there's this legal hurdle to get to the account. And that's a great question because it really is both. You know, you want to have it in physically the right place, in the right institution, and in the right investment, and in the right legal name because. If you know uh, people may not understand this, I know they don't because I get these calls all the time. Uh, they say, well, "Why don't I just open up an account in Switzerland? That's going to protect it." Well, if you open up an account in Switzerland in your own name and you get a lawsuit and a judgment here in the United States, that Swiss bank, when they get a copy of that judgment, they're simply going to turn over the money. I mean, the, ma the names match. It's, having your money in Switzerland itself is not an asset, legal asset protection. It it, it has to be combined with the actual legal entity on top of it so you know what we use we use legal tools like domestic uh, limited partnerships limited liability companies and uh, asset protection trusts and um, you know yeah that that is my main you know uh, mandate and it's been what I've done for the last uh, you know a dozen years is 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 an asset protection attorney and um and that's you know it's it's a it's a very important step so you if you're somebody that is does have a business you have employees you have risk um you have patients you know anything that creates risk then then you would add that component to everything else that we just talked about so you know you would have your your limited partnership very likely as well as an asset protection trust and you'd hold things in there if you have an office building let's say then you'd create a limited liability company to hold the office building and that company could be owned by a limited partnership which in turn is owned by an asset protection trust, creating that legal protection on top of it. So, yeah, I, I absolutely recommend both. That, or is it, can I ask some questions about that? Because I, I, it's kind sure. of nebulous to me. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, are you essentially you camouflaging the ownership and no. it's just the C of – okay, okay. No, so no. what it, is it, the protection then? Yeah, it's a great it, question. It, it's not about – you know, camouflaging the ownership and just putting up sand and going, no, I don't own it, that doesn't work. That's not good strategy. It's about having a legal entity in there that has an actual barrier that says, you know, yes, I own these assets, but I own them in this entity, and if you want to get to them, you have to go through 
the legal distinction of how to get to them. So, for example, in most states, but certainly the states we use, if you have a limited partnership, let's just say you create a limited partnership in Arizona, and you put $500,000 in that limited partnership, and you're the general partner, and you're, you're, you're also a limited partner, and your wife's a limited partner, your kids are limited partners, uh, and somebody sues you and gets a judgment against you, you're not going to say, I don't have this asset. You're going to be honest and say, I have this asset. But they're going to say, okay, great, we want it. And you're going to say, well, you have to go to the jurisdictional limited partnership, which in this case of this example is Arizona, and you're going to have to talk to the judge there. And the judge in Arizona is going to read the Arizona limited partnership statute, and that statute says that uh, creditors of uh, a, a member of a limited partnership or a partner of a limited partnership cannot get direct access. They can only get what's called a charging order, which is basically like an IOU. And so the judge respects the judgment from the other state and says, yes, we acknowledge the judgment, full faith and credit between the states. And he enters the judgment. He goes, here's a charging order. And that charging order is basically an IOU. And he says, if the, if the, if the partnership ever makes a distribution, then we're going to give it to you because we respect that judgment. But it doesn't force a distribution. And that's a very big distinction because now you've got the creditor going, wait a second, I went through all this time, expense, and money to get this judgment, and now I can't get the money? I've just got to sit here and wait for who knows how long? Um, and by the way, um, it, when tax time comes around and the, and the CPA is preparing the K-1s for the partnership return, well, since the guy holding the charging order is technically entitled to the distribution, even though there wasn't one, well, then he's actually also should be the person receiving the K-1 and paying the taxes on the amount of money that was earned, even though he didn't get a distribution. So he's actually now in a negative situation to hold this charging order for an undefined period of time. Um, and, you know, the way asset protection works is it puts you in a position to negotiate and settle. So. If you're sitting in that position, you're very likely to go, hey, okay, I see I can't get the money. I see you can't get the money. We're at a standstill. Let's come up with a number that we can both agree on and, and make this go away. And, and in reality, it very rarely gets to the charging order level because usually the plaintiffs and their attorneys who work on contingent fees are aware of this well before they spend the money to get the judgment, and settlement is reached very early in the case. And that's the power of asset protection is it allows you to be in a much stronger position with respect to someone being able to collect against you, which allows you to negotiate and settle well before you have to go through the pain and trauma of, of a full-blown lawsuit. Wow, man, I'm dumbfounded. That's pretty incredible, man. And that's... That's your legal profession, uh, the complications, the subtleties, the... Wow, that's incredible! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get... <laughs> oh my God! Wow. Okay, so they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, gotcha. They gotcha. The, the, the lawyer goes to the plaintiff. He's like, listen, you got unlucky with this one. This this guy uh, saw you coming uh, in a dream. And he prepared for it. And so as much as we, we have a case and I think we can win it for you, uh, it's no point in, in doing that. It's, this is what's going to happen. And the, and the plaintiff is all like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good way to see it, exactly what happens. And, and, and my experience is, is that you know, cases get settled nine times out of ten because that's exactly what they see. They, they, they see that there's no payoff, and the entire system of – society is especially lawyers is you know run by this payoff system and if the lawyer doesn't see the payoff why bother you know why why encourage their and remember most of these lawyers are also working on a contingent fee if they don't see how they're going to collect their steam for for taking that case and vigorously pursuing it really gets you know the wind is really taken out of their sails yeah i would say that's uh my understanding i mean i mean if you have them the money to pay them by the hour and uh, that type of thing, but still in a complicated thing, it's going to just, uh, they're going to ask for a retainer, five or 10,000 just to get going. If they see that's the way you want to play it, if they don't want to accept the contingency, then you're going to have to pony up five or 10 before them to, you know, uh, which they'll draw from. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe on a big case, it would make some sense to somebody, uh, it was two well heeled individuals suing each other that the, they would get into that. Uh, 
but uh, that's a smaller percentage of the pie than you've already willed it down to those type of people that you'd have to worry about a little bit more. So, okay, that sounds – I understand that now a lot better. Thank you. Whew, that's a trip. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, what Now, what is this – I went on your website, and you have this uh, great little uh, – I'm going to call it a, like a cartoon or something like that. Uh, yeah, ex- animation. Uh, yeah. Animation, right. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, where you're <laughs> – Packaging things, you're putting them in one suitcase and then putting the suitcase into a safe and then putting the safe into a bank vault and the bank vault into a on its own island or something like this. Uh, so just layers of protection and stuff to mine through for the creditors who are coming after you. They're just going, wow, this guy's just a, a, literally a hard nut to crack. I mean, what's up? It just never ends. It's like one of those Russian dolls that where there's like it's like one right. doll. You, pull the top off and there's another one and you're like, damn, what's this going to end or something like this? And uh, and they're going to be like, the other, the lawyer's going, oh my God, I mean, of all the clients, I had to get this one and this guy that they're going after. It's like, it's never ending. I mean, it's like, it's going to stress out my, you know, uh, whole thing. I want the easy people to, you know, get. I don't want this guy. You know, this right. guy's ridiculous. You know, yeah, he's running around, but whatever. Okay, so, all right, with that you, let's say you have these separate assets and you've got them all partitioned off, uh, you know, with the LLCs or something like that. But still, if you have an ownership interest in it, okay, I guess I'm not understanding. You have, they could still say, well, okay, you own all these different little partition things as assets. Uh, open them up, you know. Can a court well, like say that, that? No, that goes back to the state law that we were talking about. In the law of the jurisdictions, not necessarily just state, but but international. Um, that's not what the law says. The law says that you don't have to just open them up. So you can say, yes, I own it, and let's go see what the law says about whether I have to open it. And the law says you don't have to open it. So that's why asset protection is not based on hiding things, and it's not based on doing things that get you in trouble. It's based on you being able to honestly answer every question legally and and be completely honest about what it is that you have and where it is. But it also... Uh, it legally creates protections where they can't make you open it up and grab it. And, you know, the the last piece of that is the, what's called the Asset Protection Trust, and that just takes it to another level because we start adding an international jurisdiction which has specifically drafted legislation that um, is makes it very difficult for someone to get into the assets of a trust, um, which, you know, what I explained about an Arizona Limited Partnership, now multiply that times 10, and um, try to get into a Cook Islands trust. It's extremely difficult, um, and the same rationale applies. It's just extremely discouraging for a plaintiff and a plaintiff's attorney to uh, to, to to see you as a good target. And that's my whole goal as an asset protection attorney is to make my clients unattractive as targets. And if they're unattractive as targets, they're less likely to get sued or less likely to have a suit go anywhere and much more likely, even in legitimate uh, disputes and cases, to settle on favorable terms. Okay. So you guys know the law, and uh, you allow your clients to take full advantage, so to speak, or full, you know, full advantage. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying that, uh, of the law. And uh, this stuff is uh, a specialty of the law, and uh, you you, you do that, and you know these like that. Pulling that part out, I, I still that still goes over the top of me. If they, they've got the judgment, they've got the order. Now they have to pay taxes. They have to pay your taxes, or they have to pay their own taxes on the judgment that's uncollected yet, or something. Like, well, if they have a get? charging order against the partnership. The partnership has a tax. It's a pass through tax entity, so it has a, a generates a K one. So let's say that there's $500,000 in the partnership and it earned 10% that year. So it earned $50,000. So you have to pay taxes on that $50,000. All the partners do. But if the guy holding the charging order is entitled to that distribution, even though that distribution was not made, then he has to pay the pass-through taxes. So he gets the K-1 for the $50,000, and he has to include it on his tax return. So now he's paying tax on $50,000 that he didn't receive. And he's going to do that every year until there's a distribution, which maybe you know, 
20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that's really discouraging for him to want the charging order or to want to continue to hold the charging order. After one year of that, he's likely going to be call, having his attorney call your attorney saying, hey, let's let's settle this. We'll take, you know, we'll take 50 grand and, and we'll release you from this judgment and then boom, you're 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 free. Yeah, I like that. I like that. But like in that setup, if you I don't know what a charging order is. What what is that? Well, that's the IOU that that the, the that's what the remedy in Arizona is. So the statute in Arizona says the remedy against a partnership is limited to and exclusively a charging order, which is if you come in with your judgment against one of the partners and um, present it to the Arizona judge, the Arizona judge say, yes, I respect the judgment, but um, we don't make di- we don't force distributions of these partnerships. We just give you this IOU. It's basically, you know, you'll get the distribution if the general partner ever makes one, but you can't force him to make one. Okay, and in that situation, all your assets, look back on the defendant's side, all your assets are kind of screwed right now, right there, because you can't probably get them out of that. They're kind of locked, so you're in a uh, a Mexican standoff or something like that, where uh, you can't do anything either, right? Let's be fair. Correct. About situation. Yeah. Okay. Correct. You 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 may not be able to get to your assets, although you're free to continue to invest them and and do the things that the partnership was set up to do. Um, but you can't take a distribution to yourself because this guy is standing there. <laughs> but uh, I can tell yeah. you, Aaron, and and. You know, in my years of doing this, I've never actually seen someone go to the point of getting a charging order and, and sitting there waiting around for 10 years to try to, to collect on it. Every single case has settled. And, you know, that's uh, the power of asset protection is to create settlement. That's where the lawyer goes to the client and says, listen, no, no, no. Settle. Right. You know, I'll talk to him. We'll try to get as much as possible. Meanwhile, the client is pounding the table. He's like, no, let's go get him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but eventually the financial considerations usually prevail. You know, when it, when it just gets too financially prohibitive to continue, you know, fighting up against trying to ice skate uphill. Yeah, so you just you create these great fortresses that say, hey, you know, if you've got a man and machine around to break through the wall, fine. But hey, let's just do it another way. And so that's really good, I guess. So that uh, you know, maybe it's uh, that's the new normal then, where <laughs> yeah. Uh, in a dysfunctional legal system, I mean, the legal system mirrors every other system in this country, which I would consider at this point broken and dysfunctional. I mean, this shouldn't be necessary, but it is. And so as long as it is, then it's incumbent on the person that has the assets to take the steps to protect them. You know, in a society that functioned properly, where there was not this complete ridiculous um, aberration of, of uh, the law, where you know the legal system and the lawyers are are usually using the law as a legal extortion tactic, you know asset protection wouldn't be necessary. Um, but that's what's going on, and that you know uh, that's probably the subject of another show. I've written a book called The Lawsuit Lottery. You can go on Amazon and, and look it up. But that's what I basically say in the book is, you know, we have a legal system that has become a lottery, a lawsuit lottery, where the lawyers are the you know they're they're selling the tickets, they're they're trying to cash in the tickets. Um, and they're just trying to find anybody that can serve as a proxy to start a lawsuit, which is extremely expensive, and get somebody to make the financial decision that it's more expensive to fight this than to just pay them off. And that's, in my book, extortion. But that's what we've got, and in as long as that's the way it is, if you have assets and you want to stay out of that extortion racket and not be the target, then this is the counterbalance. So, you know, I'm not trying to get anybody out of paying their legitimate bills or, or, you know, debts that they agreed to. I'm trying to balance a completely imbalanced legal field. And, you know, that's why that's why we created it and that's why we do it. Well, it reminds me of a funny story I was reading before, since a few years ago, that there was uh, a bunch of lawyers uh, wanted to have like a shindig or a get together, a surfing contest. I don't know what it was. It was something along these lines, a group of lawyers getting together to party or something like that. And so they began promoting it, you know, attracting people. And then somebody filed a lawsuit. (laughs) One of the lawyers, Uh I don't, I mean, and so they scuttled the whole thing. It was just like, it was so ridiculous. It was like, uh, I don't know. There's a compelling need to, uh, Hey, I'm off. Fi- I, that's wrong. We need to get, well, we've got to go down there and file those papers on this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Okay, so we, we understand. So these are the components uh, that you really – wow. You want to – if, if uh, and this is – to be frank, you're – uh, you're you're uh, kind of geared towards uh, the more well-heeled individual for your uh, different, uh, whether it's your hedge fund or your asset protection uh, services. Uh, <clears throat> people that are wanting to come to uh, you, Doug, what, uh, what do they what do they look like? Um, you know, the, I, I, ironically, it's not the it's not just the the extremely wealthy. Obviously, if you have a lot of money and a lot of risk and businesses. And employees, et cetera, then you definitely, you know, want to you fit the profile of somebody who needs my services. But it's also just the the man next door, or the really, you know, the the person who's done well, who's you know created a business. My average client is, you know, one million dollars in net worth, you know, one to five, um, which is is you know it's the millionaire next door model. But it, it, it's if you have you know half a million dollars to five million dollars, you need all that money. To retire, to to you know uh, support the lifestyle that you've you've structured for yourself. If you have fifty million dollars, you know, and you lose five million, it's not going to affect you. You know, if you have five million dollars and you lose two million, it's really going to affect you. Uh, if you have a million and you lose two hundred thousand, it's really going to affect you. So for me, you know, the ideal sweet spot for somebody who who really should be considering protecting themselves is 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 the person who's who's created it? They've got it. They've got the business. They've got some savings, but they need it all. You know, it's really it's just they need everything that they've created. Um, that for me is the a person that is it's more important for them to do asset protection than than the billionaire. Now, I mean, the billionaire can afford to fight his battles. Um, the little guy can't, and and they're easily extorted. They're they're highly um, uh, averse to lawsuits, it's, they, it scares them. They, you know, and and paying lawyers. When you get to a certain point, you're used to paying lawyers to fight uh, lawsuits because lawsuits are part of the business. But when you're, a, you know, a dentist or a physician or a, or a contractor or a builder or a small business owner, you're not. And they're they're very destructive. I've seen lawsuits that were really in the big scheme of things not big deals they were small issues that have destroyed emotionally people because they just can't handle even the thought that someone thought they did wrong and on top of that is are going to take uh any of their money and it's it's emotionally devastating and so again my mandate that i've created for myself is to reduce fear so that people can live a fully expressed life that's what i want for the world and if we can do that by helping people to feel like they're not taking a risk every time they walk into their office or hire an employee or see a patient, um, that's good. And that helps us all. We have doctors that practice better medicine, less defensive. You know, more They're able to practice without that fear. I just don't see fear as supportive of the human experience in any way. It's just, it doesn't support us. So my goal is to reduce it. Um, and and give people tools to help them with their journey of reducing their fear in their lives. Um, so, you know, it's basically anybody who has f- that level of fear, if you're triggered right now, if you're feeling it, then, then you're a candidate. And, you know, ironically, a lot of people that probably don't have enough money to spend money on asset protection, I mean, they they're very much want that protection. I mean, they want to feel like they're protected. Um, and so, you know, I end up talking with a lot of people that are, Never clients, never going to become clients, but but are just want to have a sense of security, even just understanding what their risks are, understanding what asset protections they already have. You know, you you do have some already built in. You have the homestead exemption. You know, most retirement plans are protected. Insurance policies and annuities are protected in most cases. So you know, they're, they're just feeling secure is is highly beneficial to your life and to your experience of life. And so. Um, so that's those are the people who call me. Anybody who wants more of that. No, I mean I, that's why I want to have you on, man, because I think it's very complimentary your point of view and your system, your plan, uh, well, you know what you have to offer uh, to other people. This is really good. This is uh, I don't know. I think it's more sophisticated than okay. Let's buy a bunch of silver, put it in the safe. We're Get the bullets, get the water filter, and get the guns. <laughs> we're yeah. ready now. This is, yeah. this is I mean, a, that's a lot of it. We're we're, we're here. We're, we're trying to say, hey, listen to Doug here. This is maybe a little bit more realistic. 
I, I think so. And I mean, I understand the, you know, buy the silver and buy the ammunition. I, I, I'm empathetic to it. I really do. I, it's, it's coming from the right spot. I, I totally get it. And anybody who's, who's, you know, been kind of gone down that road, I get you. I mean, I, I understand. I know. And, you know, frankly, I don't think it's wrong. You know, have, have, have do your planning. That's fine. But don't hit your wagon to that and and become a zealot of, you know, this is the way it's going to go because you're very likely to make poor decisions. And and my job is just to help people make good decisions. And so when you hit your wagon to a philosophy, you end up closing your eyes to what's really going on around you. And, you know, we look up one day and everybody after it's happened goes, wow, why didn't we all see this? You know, for me, it's all unfolding. You know, it's not really that surprising what's going on. It's all unfolding really if you see it clearly, it's unfolding pretty much as you would expect. Um, but if you've got a, an agenda, if you've got a belief structure that you're really tied to, then you're going to be very surprised. And that's not good. Being very surprised is often uh, the recipe for very poor decision making, and that's, that's not good for us. Okay. Um, how, well, how do people get involved with uh, your hedge fund? If they, uh, I mean, how does the transition go? I mean, they give you a call, uh, you get the asset protection going first, and you say, okay, well, now we're, we're going to start, uh, you know, taking it to the next level as far as, uh, you know, what to do with those assets that we've armored. Well, you know, they still exist, and you're still uh, having cash flows. I mean, this is not going to stop the party. I mean, you got the business that's throwing off the cash. We're going to have more money coming in that needs to be, uh, you know, put into the protection mechanism. And then, of course, we want to get some yield off of it. How does it go with you if the, when a client, a new client comes to you? Yeah, well, I mean, most of my clients are, are coming through the law firm. I mean, it's, and I'm, I'm dealing primarily with clients that I already have, existing clients, you know, working to help them get get their mind around this concept and understand how this is, is really the next step in the asset protection planning process. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm – my goal is to work with people who are, are have this type of thinking. When someone calls from scratch, I really do a holistic analysis. I look at everything. I look at where they're at. I look at the legal risks, and and I look and we have a, this conversation about um, their mentality. There's times when you know the only thing that we'll be doing for them is the asset protection legal planning, um, and then there's times where you know the 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 investment portion and the full strategy of moving their money to Switzerland and. Um, uh, and the 80-20 is, is a big part of it, and that's what they want. So um, I take them as I find them, and I, and I have this conversation, and, and we try to meet where it makes sense for us. Um, you know, I'm not out there just trying to raise assets. That's not my, my goal. Um, that's not my gig. It's, I'm, I'm wanting to serve a, a defined client profile and client group, um, and if someone comes to me, you know, I'm going to look at them and, and, and talk with them from that perspective of, of the whole ball of wax. Okay. That's, so that's really a good thing. Um, I wanted to ask you, if I, if I could, uh, how about for a person that's starting a business, uh, what is some entry-level type of asset protection stuff that could start, you know, getting the mindset around? So, you know, because they, they want to be successful and they don't want the uh, carpet pulled out from under them, you know, in the first few baby steps, uh, which could happen, you know, get all gung-ho and everything like that. And a lot of things are happening at once and, and, and you forget and you leave uh, – like uh, something uh, uh, like you leave some pipe standing on its end and it falls in someone's head, cracks their head, and already your whole business is just down the twos of the lawsuit. Uh, yeah. what, what would you suggest that people get some insurance or something? Or, or well, what? for sure, yeah, you've got to do a full analysis. If you have employees, you need an excellent employee handbook. You know, you've got to have great policies. You've got to have a good understanding of employment law. Wage and hours is a huge issue now. If you've got employees, you've got to make sure they're classified properly and that you're paying them properly. And, you know, um, if they work overtime, you've got to pay the overtime. And you should have insurance, absolutely. You should have the traditional structures in place. And, um, you know, starting a business shouldn't be this, this complete risk of your entire life. I know it is for some people because, particularly if you don't plan but um but yeah i mean you know you can do that uh you know uh exactly going through every business is, is i'm sure beyond the scope of the time we have here but yes is the answer and and you can that can be done um certainly from an employment standpoint uh, you know that was it's another business that i have that i started again as a result of my clients um, it's called the Center for Employment Dispute Resolution, and it's designed to create employee handbooks for small businesses. 
and employee support for those owners so that they, you know, when your, your employee comes in and you're just about to fire her and she says, oh, great news, everybody, I'm pregnant, and, you know, you, 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 what do you do? Um, so you, uh-huh. you, there's a hotline, you call us and you say, hey, uh, this just happened, and we walk through it, and, and we help people make good decisions. Um, you know, it, it, so yes, that, I mean, if you're, if you're in that mode, that would be the first call I would make is to, um, to that type of support structure so that you can get an idea of how to set it up right. You know, getting your corporate documents set up right is important. You know, having, and then once you do have assets, let's say you're starting to make money, then yeah, you need, you need to establish your asset protection plan so that you're saving it in the right spot so where it has, um, it has a, a protection around it, and you're not just leaving it hanging out there. So, um, but you know, I'm uh, the best thing is just to start calling, start doing the research. You know, anything is solvable. Any problem, the human mind is amazing. Everybody's, and the capacity for it to figure things out is 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 really unparalleled. But the decision to make it important rests with each person. You, you've got to choose it for yourself. So, you know, there are resources out there for anything you want to know in this life. I mean, absolutely anything. But you just have to choose it. My message for anybody listening to this, if there's anything in here that has, you know, caught your attention, going, wow, yeah, I want to know more, make the decision to learn more and start picking up the phone and calling people and getting on the Internet. You'll figure it out. And um, the people you need to talk to will be on the other end of that line, but you've got to pick it up. Yeah, just to be aware of this whole concept and everything like that. I think it sounds – that's great. Uh, well, Doug, I mean, for those people that would like to uh, talk to you, uh, kick the tires a little bit on what you're uh, talking about over there, would you, do you want to give out your phone number? Uh, yeah, sure. They can call my office and schedule an appointment with me. It's uh, 602-230-2014, and, uh, and my website, of course, is lobmel.com, L-O-D-M-E-L-L.com. I also have on the money topic, a, you know, a blog that I keep called mindofmoney.com. That's where you saw the interview with Peter Campbell. Um, and uh, so, you know, any of those places you can, you can reach me. Um, and I'm absolutely available. So if anybody listening to this does want to talk, just call and ask for Coletta, who is my assistant, and uh, she can get you on my calendar. So basically you are out of uh, Florida, uh, but – you're uh, able to handle clients from all over the country. Is that the case? They don't have to necessarily come into the office. Yeah, my office is actually my my law office. Primarily is in in Arizona. Um, oh. I live in Florida, and um, yeah, most of my clients are all over the country. Particularly when you know it comes to choosing, you know, a specialist, you're free to choose anyone you want. And so, you know, tools tools that we use legally are are, are not in the person's state most often and international or in another state that's more appropriate. So, um, But, yeah, I can either help them or get them pointed in the right direction. Okay, sounds really good. Well, uh, and also I would like to say to anybody listening to this, um, if you go to his websites, uh, you'll see that he has some very nice produced uh, videos. I must say that your videos are very uh, well produced, they're very uh, good-looking videos and everything. Uh and uh, you, you've uh, taken the time to produce some very nice videos and stuff like that with some good content that is, uh, well, especially those uh, discussions you have with uh, Mr. Uh, Campbell. I think a yeah. lot of people would like to check those out. And then for people that are more legally, uh, you know, can take the legalese, uh, then those discussions with Mr. Uh, – what's his name again? Mr. Rosen? Howard Rosen, yeah. Or, or his uh, wife and uh, yeah, wife, I think there's a couple Patricia other guys. Don Levy Rosen, yeah. Yeah, very, we have very some of our great people guys. that are into great that. People. Uh, yeah, well, Richard Rao, one of our uh, co-conspirators over here, he's uh, he's a paralegal. He's got he's studying for his uh, slow leak, and he's a, he got a VA from Berkeley. He's, he wants to get into law eventually, but he's doing some other. You know that goes, I guess. Well, uh, and uh, but so, so there's some people that uh, you know around us that like to get more chop up the legal details and get this, you know try to like mess around with that kind of stuff a little bit just so we can understand help our lawyer a little bit more not try to tell yeah. them what to do <laughs> yeah you know what i mean but just stay up try to stay up to speak when they're talking to us try to understand what exactly is he talking about oh okay. yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> okay well anyways uh going on radio here with doug doug I'd like to have you back on because i would like to go into some of the other stuff uh that you're talking about and follow up with your ideas i mean you've uh We've got your scenario. What do you think is going to happen? 
uh, and uh, follow up with you, uh, you know, on how how things are transpiring and whether uh, you know this type of thing going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's talk in and see how it's all playing out. Right on. All right. Well, Doug, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Love Talk Radio.